Hmm, five mostly false myths about Scrum. That's a topic and a half for a webinar. We've got up to half an hour for our webinar today. And what I've got, I've got about 15 minutes worth of content, which I will deliver to you. And I'd like you to put in your questions into the webinar console as you think of them. And then at the end, I'll make sure we've got 10 or 15 minutes spare to cover any questions that you might have. Let's start with the big one, the obvious one, myth number one here, that Scrum, or actually maybe Agile in general, is just a fad. Hmm, let's have a think about this one. Because with a traditional plan-based approach, often known as waterfall, we would start off by producing a product specification that's very well defined and documented down to the very last detail. And then, of course, that specification gets passed on to different teams. So it goes to the architects and then it goes to the UX designers and then the coding can start and then we can test it. And finally, we can deploy it and get feedback from users. So, so that's our traditional approach. Whereas with this so-called fad of agile, instead of those great big phases that happen one after the other, we have these short cycles of up to four weeks long, which in Scrum we call sprints. So you have a two week sprint or a four week sprint or whatever. And the idea is that we produce a working iteration of our product after every cycle. Now, because each cycle is short and we're getting user feedback so fast, that means we're learning what works and what doesn't work as we go along, rather than having to anticipate it all up front like we did with the traditional plan-based approach. So we are inspecting and adapting with each iteration. And because these cycles are so short, we can, if we need to, change direction very, very easily. If maybe during one of those inspect and adapt activities, we realise we're not on track, no problem, we can just change track with the very next sprint. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't seem like a fad to me. It just seems like a smart way to work in today's fast moving world. I mean, I don't think you can deny that we're working in complex environments, so we need a way of being able to respond to that. So, so maybe the word agile feels like a fad. I mean, it is certainly a buzzword at the moment, but I see this as simply describing sensible and smart working practices to enable us to react and respond to these complex and ever-changing environments, which is the reality that most of us have to work in. And Scrum is a framework that we can use to become more agile. That really doesn't sound like a fad to me. <sighs> but then you say to me, no, Simona, it is just a fad. I've been reading articles with facts and figures that say that only a certain percentage of organisations that use Scrum will ever be successful or a certain number of CIOs surveyed predicted that Scrum will be a thing of the past in five years time or whatever. And I do accept that you might feel nervous about adopting something that might indeed end up just being a fad. But the point is, Scrum's been around since the 1990s. And the tricky thing is that the rules of Scrum are described in a really short document, you know, 16 pages or something, and it really is very lightweight and simple to understand, but it's difficult to master. So when you look more closely at some of the statistics of these failed agile projects or these Scrum implementations that didn't deliver what they were supposed to deliver, you do learn that actually these organisations weren't playing by the rules of Scrum. They maybe gave up too soon or, more commonly, they cherry-picked the bits of Scrum that they fancied implementing, which they could very easily implement and skipped the rest. And Scrum is without doubt difficult to master. So no, I don't believe that Scrum is a fad, but it is certainly a journey. You are not going to get there overnight. But the trouble is, if you've got senior management who do believe that Scrum is a fad, you're going to need to establish some trust with management. You know, they might be feeling sceptical about whether this whole agile thing is going to work. Then you might consider trying Scrum for just a small part of your development effort. You know, do some short sprints, get some feedback, and then you've got some real empirical data to help your case because it's really going to be an uphill struggle for you if you don't get stakeholder buy-in for your Scrum implementation. Now, I have got my eye on the questions window in the webinar console, so please don't forget to type in your questions as you think of them, and I'll have a look at them and answer them at the end of our webinar. OK, Scrum myth number two, and that is that Scrum projects are unmanaged. Hmm. Interesting, but this is actually a really common myth that we come across because, of course, executives, senior management and project managers have always traditionally relied very heavily on those formal project plans. Yeah, you know, They like a task based plan because it gives them that visibility of the project at a very granular level. And, and I suppose it gives them comfort that the details are being tracked and managed. 
But could I just say at this point that all plans are arguably wrong anyway, because as soon as they are made, the information used to make them is immediately out of date. So if you've got a task assigned to a particular person on a particular date in six months time or maybe even a year's time, how likely is it really that that person will actually be doing that exact task at that exact time? I think, you know, it's very unlikely indeed. But anyway, the point is that these senior executives and project managers do feel extraordinarily unsettled if they don't have a detailed task driven plan. And the approach that Scrum takes is very streamlined, where we're working on these highest priority items first in these short iterative cycles, and the work is carried out by a self-organising team. Now, this all creates this perception, an inaccurate perception I might add, but it creates this perception that there's no tracking of progress and no accountability for the work. But actually, to combat this myth, I would say that Scrum projects are actually managed more accurately than traditional projects. So at the beginning of every sprint, we have a planning meeting where we agree on which of the highest priority backlog items will be completed during the sprint and a sprint goal or the sprint objective is agreed. So you can see on the left hand side of this whiteboard here, these are the inputs to the planning meeting and the sprint goal on the right hand side is one of the outputs. And in this meeting, this team starts to identify what tasks they will need to accomplish in order to achieve that goal. And that's all documented in what we call the sprint backlog. So that's their plan of action for the sprint. And very often the tasks being completed will be depicted on a task progress board, maybe like this one here. And this really could be an actual board available for all to see in some visible area up on the wall somewhere or a sprint burn down chart where we are tracking the effort hours remaining for the days of the sprint. And again, a highly visible way of tracking progress of the sprint. And of course, at the end of the sprint, we have a working product increment and we use that sprint review meeting to actually examine that product increment and decide if it's the right next step for our product. So we are understanding and learning and inspecting and adapting. So if that isn't a tangible way of tracking progress, I don't know what is. So I do agree that in Scrum, we don't have those great big 18 month project plans. But to say that Scrum projects are unmanaged, I would say is a total myth. Now, related to this myth is the myth that Scrum skips on all the planning and the documentation. So we just saw in busting the previous myth that we absolutely do not skip on the planning. I just showed you an overview of the sprint planning meeting, for example. But in Scrum, we do what I like to call just in time planning. So why waste time planning in task level detail beyond the next sprint when the whole point of agility is that we inspect after every cycle and we adapt our course of action if necessary? What a waste of everyone's time and effort if we had planned right down to the very last task what exactly was going to happen in these sprints here, which in the end don't actually end up happening for whatever reason. You know, I'm sure you've all had experiences of version after version after version of the project plan being created because it keeps on changing. And of course, it takes somebody quite a lot of effort to keep on updating that project plan and circulate it and make it available. So in Scrum, we do the minimum amount of planning, just enough to get us to the next inspect and adapt opportunity, which in itself is planning what are the next steps for our product going to be. But the other half of this myth is about skipping on the documentation. And I know exactly where this myth has come from, and that's the manifesto for agile software development. So if you're not familiar with this, what it does, it lists four main values of agile software development, one of which is that we value working software over comprehensive documentation. Now, be really careful here, because this is not to say that we don't need any documentation. Of course we do. We need enough so that it's not a blocker, but we don't want to invest too much time in documenting stuff that is very likely to change. I mean, some organisations invest enormous amounts of man hours in keeping documentation up to date. And that's going to be a bad thing if it actually gets in the way of getting working software out there. So I think the key thing here is not to let teams take on only the agile principles that they find the most enjoyable. So these are the four values of the Agile Software Development Manifesto with the one we're interested in second on the list. And clearly, if teams take delight in skipping the documentation, which as you can imagine, they probably do, but also without having working software, 
then they absolutely have missed the point. They really have cherry picked the bits that they like from the manifesto. And that really is not going to work. So don't forget that the Agile Manifesto is not saying that we don't need the things on the right hand side here. It's just saying that the things on the left are more important. OK, myth number four here says that the hardest bit about Scrum is the organisational restructuring. So what I mean by this is, you know, trying to decide who to put in which development team, who do they report to? How many different Scrum masters do I need? Who are my product owners going to be? What on earth do I do with my project managers? Will this break the hierarchical structure of my organisation? So, yes, there will be some reshuffling of the organisational structure, which indeed might be challenging. But actually, the changes needed to become agile are much more deep rooted than simply who reports to who and, and who's labelled as working in, in what team. So the hardest bits of implementing Scrum are deep below those obvious things on the surface here. And I know it's an overused analogy, but it really is like an iceberg where there's far more going on than first meets the eye. And in Scrum, it's changing that deep rooted company culture that includes the core values and principles of the organisation that's going to be your real challenge. For example, getting people into those growth mindsets where they embrace change and they actually embrace challenges where they don't give up and things get tough. That's the level of change that's going to be your challenge, because that is where the magic really happens. And my final myth is that Scrum is all talking and no action. And again, I do hear this one quite a lot. You know, people tell me, oh, Scrum, there are so many meetings and it all gets a bit huggy feely because we have to do all this inspection and whatnot. And I do accept that some of these changes can be a bit uncomfortable for some people. So indeed, on the surface, it does appear that there are lots of meetings required in Scrum. So we have the sprint planning meeting that we already mentioned. We have the daily stand up, which happens every day during the sprint. So that's where the development team is planning that day's efforts. We have the sprint review to inspect the product increment and to check that we're still on track for what we want our product to be, that it's still the right product for the market. And then we have the sprint retrospective where the whole team inspects their own processes and relationships. Now, these are all critical activities for Scrum and they do all have very specific purposes, but they are also time boxed activities and they're going to be managed and facilitated by the Scrum Master. Now, when your organisation becomes more mature with their Scrum processes, the Scrum Master might not need to be involved so much. But at the beginning, his input is going to be absolutely critical. And therein lies the key to busting this myth, because a good scrum master will not only keep these meetings to time, but he will also ensure that they achieve what they are supposed to achieve. And as soon as that happens, people see the value of the meetings and, you know, they cease to become a problem. And certainly for us here at CBT Nuggets with our scrum implementation, these meetings happen at the same time. Every sprint is easy to schedule. It's, it's just become habitual. It's just the way we do things here. They are useful meetings and they're not a hindrance. But anyway, the Scrum Master's job is to help everyone understand and follow the practices of the Scrum framework. And he coaches and develops the team and, and works on changing those deep rooted company cultures into those agile values and principles. You know, it's not an easy job and it does require a unique set of soft skills. And yes, I mentioned that some of these inspection and adaption activities might be uncomfortable for some people. You know, we are exposing processes that aren't working well. We're exposing relationships that need improving. But, you know, Scrum isn't meant to be easy. It's meant to be disruptive. It's meant to shake up those deep rooted beliefs. And these inspection and adaptation activities can really make that happen. My goodness, some food for thought here. So here are our mostly false myths. I say mostly false because you can understand where the myths have come from, but I hope I've helped to bust them for you. Right, I am conscious of the time, so let's have a look to see if there are any questions. <laughs> 